Okay, guys, we're going to try something a little different. Um, first of all, this is the Algebra 1, Chapter 12, and End of Course material. This is our review for the test that we've been working on. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave my document camera on and deal with the problems here. So you're going to see me work actually on my test itself. So this is a little different than normally writing on that white background that I do. So first of all, if this is y equals 4 over x, you kind of have two choices. One that I've seen people do is to actually go through and make a table. Remember, if they tell you that you know, you want to figure out what your values are, some people will actually go through and make that table to do negative 2 down to positive 2 and actually graph your points. So that's one way that you could deal with this. The way that we've been focusing on this though has been that this is a version of the rational function that we've been talking about. The only difference is on this one, there's no b value, so I'm going to add a 0. And I'm also going to add a 0 at the end because there's no c. So if I want to do this, a would be 4, b would be 0, and c would be 0. That means, first of all, if a is a positive 4, your graph is going to go in those two quadrants. If b is 0, then x equals 0 is your vertical asymptote. If c equals 0, then y equals 0 is going to be your horizontal asymptote. Now I'm going to go through and just do a sketch just to make sure you have an idea of what you're doing. Remember we went through and actually drew the x and the y that are there. Now on this one, I also know that I have an x equals 0 and y equals 0 asymptotes. So x equals 0 would be a line that would sit right on top of your y-axis. If y equals 0, that's a line that sits right on top of this. Now, if my graph has to be in those two quadrants, that means that my graph is going to be in these two spots. Now, just based on that information, let me just pull this post-it note off. I'm looking for something like that. So if I'm looking at these, first of all, if I'm looking at this one, I can see right there that it hits the line. So that one doesn't work. I can see down here that it hits the x-axis, so that one doesn't work. This one is in the wrong quadrants, so this is wrong quadrants, which means that A is the only one that even looks like that remotely. Okay, so your answer is going to be A. Okay, let's look at our next one. Okay, another one of those equations that we've just been dealing with. So we're going to go through, let me put my post-it note up here, and we're going to go through and actually solve this, just like we did before. Remember, if that f of x bothers you, just make it y. So y equals a over x minus b plus c. So if I'm comparing these two, a is 3, b is 3, and c is 1. Now be careful with that b because it's x minus b. So x minus 3, so that means the 3 has to be the b value. So if a is positive, it'll be in these two quadrants. If b equals 3, then x equals 3 is a vertical asymptote. If c equals 1, then y equals 1 is the horizontal asymptote. Now they may not draw your asymptote lines on here, but you should be able to sketch it and then compare that sketch to the answers to see what you get. So if I'm doing this, here's my x and y axis. Um, if I have an x equals 3 line is the vertical asymptote, I'm going to go out here to 3 on the x axis. And there's going to be my vertical asymptote. 
going to go to y equals 1. There's my 1 spot. Now remember, these are just sketches to give you an idea if you're in the right ballpark. Now, once I get that done with the horizontal and vertical asymptotes, we have to make sure that our graph goes in those two quadrants. So it should go in here and in here. Okay, now, based on that, let me just put this and we'll start comparing. So first of all, if I look at this line, I can imagine where my asymptote lines are. They never quite touch, but they're close. So I can imagine where that would be. That actually matches this. Let's look at the other ones. This one, I can see that my imaginary lines, this is going to be negative 1 down here, and this is going to be negative 3. So I have, you know, not the right lines in the right spots. If I go here, I have 3 and negative 1. So that doesn't work, because remember, we want it to be positive 3 and positive 1. Okay, so that one's off the books. If I look at this one, my imaginary lines are at positive 1 and negative 3. So that one doesn't work. So you can see A is the only one that matches with this sketch that I've made. Okay, next problem. Oh, this is the inverse one. It says graph the relation and its inverse and use open circles to graph the points of the inverse. So in a minute, I'm going to take these. These are going to be filled in circles. And when I figure out the inverse in a minute, those are going to be the open ones. Now the thing that's really easy if you remember about inverses, I just have to take my x's and my y's and switch the numbers. So if I start to make a table just like the one that's there, if this is three, one, or 0, 3, then it's going to be 3, 0. I physically take the x and y and switch values. So if this is 4 and 2, it's going to be 2, 4. 9, 7 is going to be 7, 9. And the next one, instead of being 10, negative 1, it's going to be negative 1, 10. Now listen, I have to be able to find these points being filled in circles, and these points are going to be open ones. So if I look at these, let's take a look at C here. So 0, 3 would be right there. 4, 2, 9, 7, and 10, negative 1. So I can see all of these are the black dots that are here. Now open circles. So 3, 0, there's one of them. 2, 4, there's another. 7, 9, and negative 1, 10. So C is going to be our answer. So really all you have to do is to go through and switch your X and Y values. That's how you do it when you're talking about inverses. Now that's the same kind of idea in the next problem when it asks you to find the inverse of that. So if I'm trying to find the inverse, of this problem, I'm actually going to have to take the x's and the y's and switch them. So if I take the x's and the y's and switch them, it's going to become x equals 7y squared minus 3. So when you're doing this, the first thing that you're doing is switching that x and y. Then you just have to put it in y equals form. So if I want to get y by itself, it might help to actually put the y first. So I'm going to switch sides. I'm going to do 7y squared minus 3 equals x. So I'm going to add 3 to both sides. So once I do that, I get 7y squared equals x plus 3. Then I would have to divide both sides by 7. So these cancel. So y squared equals x plus 3 over 7. Then to do y, plus or minus the square root of x plus 3 over 7. 
Now that means back in this problem that I was dealing with up here further, that A is going to be my answer. Okay, next one. Okay, y equals 4 to the x. First of all, that 4 is a number that is bigger than 1, which means that I know that this has got to be exponential growth. Which means if I look at all of these graphs right here, this is a problem because it's below the x-axis. This is a problem because it goes below the x-axis. So I know it's got to be one of these two. Now, one thing that we may want to consider is originally this equation must have been this. y equals 1 times 4 to the x. Because remember how we talked about y equals a times b to the x has to be the piece that we look for. I added 1 because there wasn't a number there. Remember when there's not a number there, we assume it's 1. And that 1 also means that it's my y-intercept. Which means if I look at these two graphs, this one is wrong because it's got 4 as a y-intercept. This one hits down here at 1, so my answer would be D. Okay, and the next one. They want us to be able to write an initial population. Now before I do anything, I'm just going to put this post-it note here, and I'm going to write out my general equation for my exponentials. So they tell you your initial population is 895 quail. So 895 is going to go in this spot. Now they tell you that the rate of the population of quails increases by 7%. So to get B, remember we start out with 100, we add 7, we get 107%, which is 1.07. So that's the value that's actually going to go in for B. So my equation is going to be y equals 895 times 1.07 to the x power, which means that out of the ones that are up here on number 6, that I only have one of them that is actually going to fit that, and that's going to be A. Okay, now, um, 6, 7, and 8 are really meant to be easy problems, although I have to say that some have really struggled with this next one. If this is my equation and they want to know if it increases or decreases, that 2.3 is a decimal. If I want to make it a percent, it's going to be 230 percent. Now remember, in order to get that, 230 has to be kind of the answer to the problem down here. So I have to take 100 and what would I have to add to it to get to 230? which means that I would have to add 130. So this is what they're looking for. They're looking for what does the increase have to be. So that means on 7, my answer is going to have to be B. A lot of people write A because they assume, you know, it's 2.3, I make it 230%, that's what it should be. But you have to consider this part. Okay, let's look at 8. On 8, for an annual rate of change of negative 31, that means if I started at 100, if I have negative 31, that means 69 is going to be my actual percent, which is 0.69. So that means on 8, my answer is going to be B. Okay, let's see if we can fit one more in here. Okay, they want us to take this and write it in log form. And a lot of people have a hard time with this because they have been asking, can I take it and write it like this? Because really what I have to do is I have to be able to compare it to this. So that means I can figure out what each of these are going to be worth. So y is 1296, b is 6, and x is 4. And then I have to put it together into this form. So it's going to be log base 6 of 1296 equals 4. So if I go back to look at my answer,